มุทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะรหัตโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะมุทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะรหัตโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะมุทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะรหัตโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะพุทธังธรรมังสังฆังนามัสามิเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเราเห็นว่าคนเ
you go to maybe go to a doctor's clinic and there'll always be background music kind of serenading you whatever you do putting you into a certain mood and the same with um, say news and things which you see on internet or phones it's always bad news as we know most of the news tend to be focusing on what's going wrong with the world so either we're being lulled into a kind of drowsy state where we're not very mindful or we're being stimulated to the point where we're kind of afraid of what's coming next or what's going on in the world fear fear and anxiety are stimulated we once had a cameraman from channel 10 came to the monastery and he would go out with his team kind of waiting for news stories around Sydney they'd drive around and they'd either be called to a story by a journalist or they'd just hear about things and turn up to start filming and they had to choose sometimes what to film and they had a list of ten themes and basically the story that had the most blood in it so death, injury was top of the list any Anything that involved people dying, people getting injured or hurt, that's where they had to go first. Because it it sells. The more damage and destruction, the more pain, the more death in the news in the news story, the more it will sell. Because that's what catches people's attention. And in terms of selling news, that's what they want. They want your attention. So you never hear the story that 25 million Australians just went about their business today and nothing much happened and they're all peaceful and happy. You you never hear that story (laughs) because it doesn't sell, sell, it doesn't grab your attention. But you do hear the story of the terrible car accident or the murder or the you know, the bushfire or the whatever that story you will hear because it grabs your attention and may even you know, stimulate fear, anxiety in you which sells and uh, so different websites podcasts social media often they have a vested interest to stimulate your fear and anxiety so they'll you know they they encourage stories and sites that are political maybe or get you upset angry worried because it will sell they can sell their advertising they can sell and they, you'll take more pay more attention to them they don't want you to be peaceful because that doesn't sell very well. So I say monasteries are never in the news. Go to a monastery and there's 50 people or 20 people or 100 people meditating, it doesn't make the news. (laughs) It may catch your attention but only when you meet it in person. So I always remember when somebody came to Ajahn Chah's monastery on the 16th of January when they have the annual retreat, the memorial retreat, remembering Ajahn Chah's life and the day he passed away, the 16th of January. And that year there was about 5,000 people in the monastery, about 1,000 monastics, monks and nuns, and 4,000 lay people camping and that's not counting day visitors just coming and going, so it's probably more like 10,000 people. But of the people keeping precepts, meditating, staying in the monastery, there's about a thousand, uh, 5,000 people. And the, the, a group of Europeans came and they 
their their guide cornered me because I'm obviously not Thai. They, they wanted a Western monk just to guide these people through the grounds. So I had a few moments spare. So I guided these people through the grounds of Ajahn Chah's monastery. And they were stunned by the silence and the good atmosphere. And when I told them there's 5,000 people here, they couldn't believe it. At that moment, there was um, it was a meditation session, it was about two in the afternoon. Everyone was sitting in the hall or in the, on the floor of the forest or in their tent, and everyone was just quiet, peaceful, meditating. It's very hard to find large numbers of people doing that. That kind of bucks the trend in the sense that, as I said, usually we, are, we pay attention when there's something that brings up fear, anxiety, like the news, bad news. But this was so unusual, it got everyone's attention. That, all these visitors to the monastery, they, they were surprised by how peaceful and well behaved so many people were in the forest. But normally speaking, it doesn't make the news, does it? People meditating. <laughs> There's nothing happening. You know, the, the director of the, the news company is going to be frustrated. You know, they want something to happen. They want an interview at least, or they want uh, action. So everyone's just sitting there still, and there's not much happening. Not very good news. Even when they interview someone, they want, they want to see people expressing emotions, you know, telling you how bad it was, or what happened, or how good it was in the case of... You know, Say so like last night we heard that Australia won their Soccer World Cup, the women's team, so they all want to interview people after their great victory. So they want the stimulation of victory and the joy and everyone's excited and happy. Again, it's good news. Or else they want blood and death, because <laughs> that's stimulating. What they want is stimulation. There was one time in, uh, when there was the tsunami in Pua, uh, that well, it went all through Southeast Asia, and unfortunately hundreds of thousands of people died in one very short space of time. But uh, there was one man I knew who was translating for an American team of journalists and cameramen from CNN. They were down in Phuket interviewing people after the tsunami, interviewing people who had lost their family member or who had lost their home or their business because lots of homes were destroyed, businesses was, were destroyed. And they were getting very frustrated because everyone they interviewed, you know, 99% of the people they were interviewing were Thai Buddhists who were all being very calm, responsible, and not displaying the trauma that the, the journalists wanted to see. They'd interview people who were accepting what had happened because they were using their Buddhist knowledge and understanding of karma and their practice of Buddhism to deal with a difficult situation and they were dealing with it very well. As one man I knew, he was interviewed he opened his hotel. His hotel was undamaged in the centre of the town. And he opened his hotel to allow people who, whose hotel had been damaged and had lost their belongings, their passports, or money, or all their possessions, and they were waiting to get out of Phuket. He opened his hotel and let them stay free. So he responded to the tsunami with generosity and kindness, compassion. So they interviewed him, but they weren't happy because all he was doing was telling them about his practice of generosity and he was very calm. And then they interviewed people who had 
lost a partner or family member actually and they had somebody who had died and they were very calm and they say well they're receiving so much goodwill and they have to accept this is karma it's not what they wanted but it's happened and sometimes things in life happen that you don't want you but you can't control you know they were displaying buddhist wisdom and so again the interviewer was not happy because they wanted people who were crying and wailing and being despairing and it was quite hard to find people like that people were coping better than they expected so that's not good news is it they want people to display strong emotions in at a time of stress and suffering Maybe Buddhism doesn't make good news. <laughs> but it's the world we live in, you know, the world of news, social media, information, exchanging information. So now you hear about trauma and suffering all over the world. Because that's what sells. If you're not careful when you receive this information, well, it will make you anxious even depressed, you can become depressed if you're just filling your mind full of negative news and you don't maintain mindfulness and discernment, it will shock you, it will put you in a, a gloomy mood if you're not careful. Just as entertainments will put you in a, a mood of um, temporary happiness, excitement, or relax you to the point where you're off your guard too much. You're either too relaxed or you're too anxious in life. And a lot of technology and social media is exaggerating that. So they want, when, you, when people want to sell you things, they try to relax you. So they, now again, you get adverts where people are telling jokes or there's music, there's pictures of beautiful people, there's background music when you're in shops and places, everything is designed to relax you so you buy more. <laughs> and they'll give you the sales talk, so everyone can do sales talk nowadays about how good their product is, how you need it. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know, if someone is good at it, then they can sell you anything. <laughs> I mean, it's a skill, but it's also based on trying to make you off guard, put you off guard. So you're not mindful, you're not discerning, you're not being careful and reflecting on what you really need or not. So even technology, social media, tends to push us to extremes. We're either living with heightened anxiety or we're so relaxed that we become careless and just buy a lot of stuff that we don't need <laughs> or more than we need. He's just pointing out the dangers of the human mind that is untrained or unguarded. The Buddha said the practice of mindfulness is like you're learning to guard over your mind, guard over your senses. So we have six doorways into our heart, into our mind, and they need to be guarded. So he's always encouraging monks, but lay practitioners as well. You guard your senses. Don't just let your senses rule your heart and you know, put you into a state of fear and anxiety or into a state of being so relaxed that your your desires take over your mind and you can't let go of them or can't see beyond them. Maintain mindfulness when you're seeing, when you're hearing. That means when you're looking at your phone, because it's mainly visual and... So an audio, isn't it, when you're looking at a phone or a computer. If you're in a restaurant, you guard your mouth. <laughs> guard your nose because of the smell. We need to 
practice mindfulness to guard our senses because the way the world is developing, we're developing ways to catch people's senses off guard all the time, stimulate us in one way or another. It's not really a conspiracy or some kind of plot that one particular person has, although there's a part of that, because you know, if someone's trying to sell something, well, they do want to get you, they grab your attention. But it's also just you know, the, the consequences of modern lifestyle, technology, and all the products and things and ideas that we are manufacturing. So now even you know, with artificial intelligence, you, know, you can manufacture ideas or at least grab ideas and put them all in one place, just at the push of a button. And then with algorithms and computer technology, you can grab all the data about someone without them even knowing so now people are finding that they're, they're already pigeonholed, pigeonholed by media companies and advertisers before they even know it. They're, they're already selected you know, according to age, gender, sexual preference, political preference, religion. So you notice if you're a Buddhist and you listen to Buddhist Dhamma talks, then you'll start getting adverts for meditation cushions pushed to your YouTube or whatever, or Facebook or whatever it is. <laughs> and that's the modern world, so we have to be on our guard more than ever. Maybe it's harder than before, I don't know. Harder to practice because there's more stimulation. But the actual way of practice hasn't really changed since the time of the Buddha. Guard your senses, guard your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, touch, and then the mind itself. That's why, say like here, we live in the forest and you know, the lay people are generous. We bought a lot of forest here. We have a, a large area of forest that we look after. This is an investment for the future because maybe one day there won't be any quiet places left in the world. Maybe the world will become so urbanized, it'll be quite hard to find a place where there's just trees, mountains, and rivers. Anyway, this will be one little place, hopefully. I mean, we are, at the moment, we're luckily we're surrounded by national park as well but who knows what the future holds as the world world's population increases but it meant the the amount of stimulation from technology and modern development and basically just people will keep growing so we have to be ready for that we have to come back to the basics of buddhist practice you know sila samadhi panya Not necessarily that technology is wrong, but you need sila to deal with it. You need wisdom to deal with it. Because as we know, you know, what what forms of technology sell best and make the best money in the world? Well, it tends to be selling arms, you know, development of arms, weapons, ways of killing people, security. All, that, all of that is what sells best and what I mean, people put most effort into their, the research, the technology, governments, private corporations, individuals. The amount of money put into spreading the Dharma is <laughs> very small in comparison. There's not much money in you know, Dharma talks, I mean, our Dharma talks, there's no money in them because we don't, we, don't, we don't sell them. But even if you did sell them, you know, obviously some people, they teach meditation and earn money at it or whatever. There's not much money in Dharma <laughs> compared to the arms industry. <laughs> that's obviously a, that's a teaching, isn't it? The human nature is 
generally will go for what brings us more wealth, more power, more influence. So that will be power through weapons, power through information, wealth, wealth creation. But what is really useful for human beings, the Dhamma is very low on people's priority. You know, how much internet traffic is to do with the spread of Dhamma and the practice of Dhamma is tiny. <laughs> What's the biggest traffic on the internet was probably pornography, isn't it? It's far away from the Dhamma, far away from sense restraint, far away from renunciation, far away from insight into impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and not self in the universal characteristics of existence. When people are stuck into sensuality, you know, watching porn or entertainments, they're not reflecting on impermanence, they're not reflecting on dukkha, not reflecting on not-self. So that's the dangers of modern technology. It stimulates the defilements, greed, anger, delusion, very easily, heightens them. But the way out of it, you know, the way of practice hasn't really changed. Establish mindfulness, what your eyes are looking at. Establish mindfulness and introduce the reflection on these universal characteristics. What you see is impermanent. But you don't have to believe that as a theory. You know, it's, that's something you observe in your experience. What you see is impermanent. The seeing, the consciousness that arises when you're seeing is impermanent. The thing you're seeing is impermanent. Nothing lasts. And then the feelings that are stimulated, the pleasure, the pain, are impermanent. That's what people buying and selling things don't want you to think of. Because if you think about impermanence, you might not buy the product because you'll just be thinking, oh, it's not going to last anyway. <laughs> but if you're seeing impermanence, you know, it's very helpful for living in this world because there's so many products, so many things for sale. You, know, you can't possibly have or buy everything anyway. But if you can see impermanence, then it allows you to at least be a little bit discerning and choose what you really need, what's really useful for you, for others, as opposed to what's just going to give you a quick buzz or a quick bit of pleasure. But as you use technology and as you interact with the world, through work, through socialising, family, whatever. We need to establish this practice of mindfulness so that we can reflect on what's going on, see the deeper truths, introduce the reflection on impermanence, what we call dukkha, which as a universal characteristic we t tend to translate as unsatisfactoriness, meaning the way the objects of our senses cannot produce lasting happiness. So if it's not lasting, it's not really true in the sense. Very temporary kinds of happiness are not able to bring you contentment, not able to completely satisfy your you. And what is temporary unsatisfactory is not self. The idea being that self has to be something that is permanent and under your control. But what is temporary cannot you cannot ultimately have or own. These three universal characteristics, you know, the Buddha said, use them as a tool to, to investigate, reflect on your experience. Because it makes you cleverer, makes you smarter, wiser, 
and it helps you to understand the world better and makes you more peaceful because as you become more mindful and reflect on impermanence for example you're less deluded by things And sometimes it's good just to reflect on you, say how much suffering have you had in your life when you couldn't accept the impermanence of something? When something you liked changed, went away from you, disappeared, some pleasure you couldn't sustain, some success that you couldn't sustain, good health that you couldn't sustain, relationships, all kinds of situations and experiences in life. You know, we, if we identify it as something good that brings us pleasure, then when it changes on us, we suffer. If we haven't seen impermanence. Of course, when you see impermanence, you're ready for the change, then it's easier to accept. And when we live with other people, often we get caught into ill will. You know, husbands and wives, parents and children, brothers, sisters, work colleagues. A lot of ill will because we're not seeing impermanence. We take things very seriously. We argue over our opinions and our ways of doing things. When you see impermanence, it's a great leveler and you realize well, maybe things that you took seriously that you got very worked up about are not so important because they're impermanent you know, views and opinions we have on everything can split people apart even families split apart groups of people split apart over views and opinions but how uncertain and temporary are our views and opinions on things Maybe reflect back on your life, depending on how old you are. You know, ten years ago, the views and opinions you held, are they the same as you have now? Even practicing Dhamma, you know, what you thought is correct Dhamma practice, you have to practice in this way, do things in this way, that can change. Maybe you see it with uh, techniques in meditation. For a period of time, somebody has a technique of meditating a reflection or a meditation object or theme that really works for them for a period of time. And then gradually, maybe it wears out, its usefulness is <coughs> used up. Maybe it no longer holds their attention, no longer brings them the peace. Or maybe they even noticed they were practicing and, and they were not particularly peaceful at all anyway. And so their opinion changes, oh, that's not the technique for me. The meditation techniques, people often, they, they move from one to another over time. Sometimes it's just through experience. It's not that techniques that we give up are all wrong. And maybe we move on to something that's uh, before we couldn't do, like many people, they, they find meditating on the breath at first quite challenging because the breath is a very subtle feeling. So they often take up a, another form of meditation before that. Maybe the meditation on loving kindness or even the meditation on reflection on death or something like that. They practice that for a while, maybe a number of years, and then they feel ready to turn to using the breath. But sometimes it's more just a fashion thing and you, you, you try something, maybe you meet a teacher or hear something, read a book or something and you try something and you think, oh, this is it. And for a little while, because it's new, it's stimulating, it seems to work and then after a while, you lose interest. I remember there was somebody who 
found it painful sitting meditation so they said oh I've got to lie down somebody taught them to lie and do lying down meditation so for a while they said this is it this is the way to meditate for me lying down then after a while they realized they're just falling asleep lying down so then they said mm, no no lying down is not good <laughs> and after that they never wanted to go back to lying down because it's too risky just fall asleep so back to sitting some people get into walking meditation, some people get into walking meditation for a while and then they go back to sitting. Even meditation techniques change on us and our views about them change. Views about how much we sleep, how much we eat, diet, views about all kinds of things, even just to do with Dhamma, can change. Something that you help to passionately for a while, then later move on for it or from it. Sometimes people, you know, they say, I, I practice Vipassana meditation for a number of years. And then later they somebody teaches them a samatha method and they experience you know, greater rapture or peace than they've had before. And then they say, oh, vipassana didn't work for me, now I'm doing samatha. So even with spiritual practice, teachers, techniques, our opinions can change. And of course on everything else in the world, our opinions change all the time. What is the right food, the right diet, the right place, the right job, the right clothing? Like when you're, you know, you're a teenager, you wear one kind of clothing. When you're in your 20s, you wear different kinds of clothing. When you're in your 30s and 40s, it changes again. <laughs> and then suddenly you're old and you wear clothing that you... You swore you'd never wear when you were young. <laughs> Luckily as a monk you get out of that kind of problem because you just have one kind of robe <laughs> all through your monk's life. But even then you never know, like in Thailand we, we dye our robes with uh, the jackfruit tree wood and you have new robes that are always very light, yellowy colour because the white cotton do doesn't absorb colour so well. But then as you wash your robes, the colour becomes stronger, more intense. So you have a period where they're sort of this orangey brown. And as you get older robes, they go a dark brown, it's sort of a faded dark brown. Some monks like that faded dark brown because they, they say, oh, it's the colour of a, a, a real meditation master. They always have these very dark brown robes. So some monks make their robe go that colour from day one. They don't want the yellow, bright yellow colour, so they get the dark colour, so they can look like a, a meditation master from their first day in the robes. <laughs> so even monks can get into opinions and views about the colour of their robes. <laughs> and of course, you probably if you ever go to Thailand, you'll see, well, there's different colours as, again, there's the, the study monks have bright orange robes and the meditation monks have a more faded brown colour. Some monks have a sort of red maroon colour. <laughs> so even monks can have different colours that they attach to. <laughs> I used to live with a monk who was into patched robes. So he's always patching his robes and he just he had one robe and he kept it for many years, so he just kept patching it and patching it till he looked like some kind of almost like a sort of circus clown with the, all the patches, got very attached to that. So even monks can get attached to their robes. <laughs> and then lay people, well, our clothes are our identity, aren't they? What we wear can often define who we are. And we get passionate about, passionate about the right kind of clothing, the right kind of shoes. Whatever it is in life, our opinions and views can become very strong. The way we arrange our house. So monks, we go and bless people's houses and then they, 
Some people are really into feng shui and they say, I've got to have everything like this. And another person comes along and you, you have different feng shui masters. And they say, no, 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 that's all wrong. You know, the, the chair is in the wrong place. The bookcase is in the wrong place. The angles are all wrong. And people have their lucky numbers. People have their lucky positions. <laughs> It's endless, isn't it? And it changes as well. Maybe by the time you get a bit older, you don't care anymore. So what used to get you really fired up doesn't matter anymore. Maybe you chill out, you relax. <laughs> you say, oh, it was all impermanent anyway. But we have to be on our guard, keep mindfulness, keep bringing up the mindfulness because there's so much sense stimulation in the world and it stirs us up. You know, why do we become angry? Why do we become sad? And not, why do we become caught into a greed and obsession? Well, it's through the senses, seeing things may not realize it because half the time we're not that mindful, but if you reflect on it, establish mindfulness, reflect on what's going on. You know, our emotions come through the senses, sense stimulation. And if you keep reacting with craving, desire, then that hardens into attachment. And then we experience what we call becoming. You become a certain way, you're sort of view of the world and the way you do things becomes established you get set we say you get set in your ways you know what you like you know what you don't like and you tend to act accordingly so we we you know becomes part of our personality or the things that we like you know, become set we may accumulate more likes and pleasures through life of course but there'll be a certain amount of mental baggage we're just carrying along what we call attachment, clinging. Craving hardens into attachment and it becomes just a habitual, automatic way we respond to experience. Oh, this is like what I like. What I like we see as good for me, so that becomes like an extension of ourselves. So you say you like certain kind of music or a certain kind of food, and you know, that becomes part of your personality. And then that will also determine what you don't like. And there'll be things you don't like, which also becomes part of your personality. I don't like this, I don't want that. And that becomes an attachment. If we never establish mindfulness and investigate this, then we're just constantly reacting to things with our likes and dislikes. So you see, when the Buddha taught meditation, he's always saying, Set aside your preferences, your your delights and your aversions. Set them aside. Because otherwise the mind is just constantly reacting with emotions. This feeds more views and opinions and we never find any peace. And when you practice a mindfulness of, mindfulness of breathing, if that's what you're practicing, or set aside your likes and your dislikes. Learn to be at peace with whatever's coming up. And this is a skill that comes through practicing mindfulness. In mindfulness is a quality of mind. It's, it's that ability just to know the way things are, but without falling into reactions of liking and disliking, attraction and aversion. So you know what you're attracted to because obviously you've got your personal history and you know what, what things you like. But as you establish mindfulness, you're just knowing the attractive qualities, what it is you like about something, but you're not letting your mind move towards it and stir you up. And aversion is the same. You know what you don't like about something, but you don't let that rule your mind. You just know oh, it's like that. Yeah, that's, 
unpleasant, that's painful. There's a lot of pleasure and pain we can't avoid. You can't always avoid it. You know, some you can, you've got choices, but sometimes you don't have choice. There's some, like you need to eat food and generally there'll be some aspects of eating food that are pleasant. You know, if you're not drinking quenches your thirst, food quenches your hunger. There's the pleasant taste, smell of food. You, know, you can't completely avoid that. But it's the indulgence in the pleasure that you're trying to be aware of by establishing mindfulness and reflecting you know, how much do I need to eat of the food that's available. Same with pain. Your physical, your body is never going to completely be without pain. We get pleasure through the body and we get pain. It becomes it's part of a package. Two for the price of one. <laughs> you got one body and you get pleasure and pain. But the way the Buddha encourages us to deal with it is know it. Oh, pain is like this. It's uncomfortable, it's not what we want. But quite often it's unavoidable. Pleasure is like this, pain is like that. Cultivating this quality of mindfulness is it's characterized by equanimity, keeping your mind in the middle towards the experience that you're having. You may have a view on things, what you like, what you don't like, what you think is good and right, what you think is wrong. But by keeping mindful, you're mindful of a view. This view is like this. I hold this view, but I don't hold so tightly that it makes me angry when someone disagrees or that makes me go and do something foolish because of my view. When you practice mindfulness, you can hold to a view, but not so tightly that it causes you suffering. We need that, especially as we have to deal with the world, you know, the world and its all the information we're getting every day. You know, we do get to hear unpleasant news. If you can establish mindfulness, then it helps you to deal with that. So you know it is unpleasant and there's sad things going on in the world, crazy things going on in the world, and the same for exciting, you know, pleasurable information that comes our way when we get what we want, what we like. Same, learning to keep the mind central so that we can reflect on the, you know, what we're involved with, what we're experiencing rather than just reacting, reinforcing our attachments. You notice when you are mindful you, you have choice. You can choose how to respond. So like say you're you hear bad news and you hear you know, bushfire in Hawaii wipes out a, a town saying unfortunately people die and houses are destroyed and they, you know, they have the worst disaster they've ever had. You know, terrible news, very sad. How do you listen to that with mindfulness? Well, you listen to it, you know the news, you know it's sad but then you th maybe if you're mindful you can think well what can I do? Maybe there's some small act of kindness you can do. You can maybe contribute to a charity or depending on where you are in the world, what you're doing, maybe there's some, some way you can give support. Or If there's nothing you can do physically, maybe just mentally you can meditate and send your thoughts, wish the people to be safe and free from suffering or if people have lost their lives, you can share merit with them. May they attain a good rebirth. There's always something you can do on one level or another, physical, verbal, mental. You could go to your government and encourage them to send help. Sometimes we do that. If it's bushfires, you know, Australia is a country of bushfires so often when other countries have bushfires, Australia is quite good at sending firefighters and equipment to help because they know what the problem is. 
And you can encourage your government, oh, send some help. You just do what you can, but you don't let the suffering of the situation overwhelm your mind. So you know it's sad, but you don't let that sadness paralyze you or you become so emotional that you can't function. Because that's what you know, our negative emotions do to us. They, they freeze the mind so we can't think straight and can't understand the situation. Strong greed does that, strong lust does that, strong anger does that, fear does that. These are what the, we call the biases of the mind. Akati is the word in Pali. You need the bias of greed, the bias of anger, bias of fear, delusion. When we're not mindful, our wisdom disappears and we, we fall into biases. So we tend to you know, go into autopilot. So things that stimulate greed, we just follow the greed. I want that, I like that. Become more like zombies, just following our, our obsessions. You know, when you you notice that when you're, you're with entertainments, I regularly get parents coming to ask me here. They say, "Oh, can you teach my son not to just get stuck on video games all day, all night?" You become a zombie when the you know the greed to to win or just the stimulation from the game takes over. There's no more mindfulness, there's no more discernment or understanding. It's just play, play, play <laughs> to the point where not eating, not sleeping, not doing anything else. That's obsession. Could be video games, could be pornography, could be gambling, could be drinking. You know, There's so many things we get stuck into, but basically it's greed drawn in by pleasure, delight in the beginning to the point where it becomes addictive when maybe there's very little pleasure left but it's just stuck, the mind is stuck there, obsessed. Aversion is the same, when we get caught into aversion we can't think straight, we can't make good decisions, it's very destructive, so it leads us to fight, argue, take it out on others, sometimes take it out on ourselves because there's no mindfulness, we're not reflecting. Even, you know, say you hear bad news about something happening in another part of the world, we could get averse to that, it can go, we can go to depression, sadness, which is another form of aversion. And then the mind doesn't function very well, does it? Can't make a good decision because of the lack of mindfulness. The Buddha said mindfulness is always beneficial to us right? because it supports all the other good qualities. Wisdom, reflection, patience, compassion, all the other useful qualities that humans have are supported when the mindfulness is present. So it's one of these kind of universally applicable qualities that will then allow our intelligence and human qualities to come out and function well. So there's plenty of challenges in the modern world, but we still have all these good teachings from the Buddha that we can employ, practice. Uh, so I'll encourage you all to keep up your practice and don't give up despite the challenges. Maybe for tonight I'll uh, just say this much and uh, afterwards if there's any questions I'll be happy to answer them.